<laughs> Welcome to another exciting conversation about money featuring Dr. David Washira and on this one he goes deep. Let's design a lifestyle, a practical lifestyle for someone who earns 30,000. Let's make them a millionaire. So that's the max that you should pay in rent. Huh? From common financial mistakes we make in our daily lives. Someone earning half a million but they are broke by the fifth. If you can't budget 100 shillings, even if I give you a million, you won't be able to budget it. To how life choices affect your journey of wealth creation. At the end of the day, my dad said, God is not going to come ask you, why did you marry this one and this one? Now I created them all equal. It's for you to be able to articulate and live with that answer. In the world of today, I wonder how you've maintained your relationship with God, right? And still are making serious boss moves. What do you do if you're pushed to your back, you know, as we say in English, between a rock and a hard place? Huh? Doesn't matter who you are, you suddenly become a little bit religious. <laughs> <laughs> now, Dr. Washida goes as far as breaking down the ideal lifestyle, and he also shares financial planning strategies that can unlock some of the situation you find yourself stuck in. Doesn't necessarily mean that because I can pay a maximum of nine thousand that I you say need to yeah that you need 9, to take yeah. So then we go to transportation, huh? and that is both knowingly and unknowingly. A vast majority of us are in situations of poverty from the actions that we take. And the worst part is some people don't know that they're suffering. Huh? Dr. David Washida also shares ideas on how you can benefit from the exchange rate, foreign exchange nini nini. So technically, I, in that particular example, I borrowed 100,000, but I'm paying the, the bank 91,000. So why wouldn't I use their money? In case you missed our first conversation with Dr. David Washida, we are leaving a link for you in the description below. I'm Dr. Kingori, and here's another reason to stay subscribed to our channel. Come on, just subscribe. Now's a good time to hit subscribe and turn on the notifications bell. We will talk about budgeting, but in our previous conversation, mm -hmm. uh, like our one-on-one -on -one chat, you said some very interesting things about the, how the exchange rate affects people. And then uh, a friend of mine, Gaur Semelango, who was our guest in our previous episode, uh, told us something that when you borrow in dollars, the interest rate never goes beyond 5%. Ikienda sana, 6% which is an advantage. And again, in our last conversation, you, you also told us that the, uh, the, the currency does not matter much. 5% uh, is 5%. So um, what are the advantages of borrowing in dollars in the local market? If you can, let's say, borrow at 5% yeah. compared to local currency, where you have to borrow at, sometimes it goes over 20%. Yeah, I think there are a variety of reasons why one would want to borrow in dollars and pay back in KES or, or in another currency. And that's largely based on you know, what your end goal is. So if you're a person who has access to a lot of Forex, then it makes sense to borrow in dollars. If you have access to a lot of KES, um, it may be difficult uh, at times when there's a devaluation of, of KES against the dollar for you to pay back. In the current environment, at least, and by the current environment, I mean the last three weeks, if you have KES and you're converting it to dollars, it's been a good time to do so mm -hmm. because we went from 163 to today was 139. Mm -hmm. In that particular example, if you had been buying a property, you know, that was 22 million mm -hmm. and you are paying that in, in dollars, it would have equated to around 139,000. Okay? But today, uh, if you're making that same property three weeks later, you would need to borrow 158,000 yes, because yes. they... Kenyan currency has gained in value against the US dollar. Yes. Now, if you're in the rental market and you're receiving a salary in dollars, then it makes sense to continue to receive that salary in dollars, but make out your payouts in KES because all else being equal, the dollar is a reserve currency, so it tends to hold its value better mm -hmm. than other currencies in yes. general. Yes. Uh, and that's why it's beneficial if you have access to borrowing in dollars to do so. And especially if the interest rate is rock, locked at like 6%, whereas the Kenyan one may be at 13 14% and fluctuating. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And there's something sweet, um, and not, about, not for you specifically, but let's just generalize. There's something mm -hmm. sweet about the, the Kenyan shilling weakening against the dollar when you get paid in dollars. Yes. Not for the country in general, for the individual. For the individual. <laughs> yes, it makes a lot of sense. So as a good Christian... What do you pray for? <laughs> the, shilling to, <laughs> the shilling to weaken more, um, uh, the dollar to get stronger. Funny, I was speaking to my business partner earlier today, and he sent me a screen print on, uh, 
on the KES to dollar, and today it, had, it, it started off at 142 and it dropped to 138. Yes. Now, for me, I needed to pay my rent today, you know, and uh, I was looking at it and I, I should have telling myself I should have converted in the morning when it was at 142 yeah. because that failure to convert, I'm now losing four shillings to the dollar for the same amount. So now I'm paying more in dollars than I would have been in, in, in KES. Mm. So it's difficult to pray for as a country. You know, you want the Kenya shilling to strengthen. Mm -hmm. As an individual, of course, I'm selfish. You know, I want yes. it to weaken because my bills yes, uh, yes, yes. are in yes. KES, but I have access to dollars. But all legs being equal, it's actually beneficial for all of us if the Kenya shilling continues to strengthen, particularly for basket goods, you know, that we receive, you know, mm -hmm. imports, for example, if anybody's importing um, items this month, it is much cheaper for them, like literally almost 15% cheaper than it was three weeks ago. So for them, they are very happy. If, however, the shilling was appreciating, uh, things become more and more expensive. So for example, for simple mathematics, uh, say the Kenya shilling was at 100, um, shillings to one dollar today, and I'm an importer. If that remains the same or drops to 85 shillings to the dollar, then I'm saving 15% when I'm doing because I have access to Kenyan uh, uh, shillings. However, if it increases to like 130, the dollar bill still remains the same, but now I'm paying 130 shillings, a 30% increase. So those fluctuation, especially when it's not uh, predictable, it's really harmful for anyone who's in the import-export business, at least trying to get goods um, in, in Kenya. And to the, to the individual, to the Kenyan individual, the most scary thing about the fluctuating of the dollar prices, um, I think I found this extremely scary, that every time the Kenyan shilling loses value against the dollar, uh, if you don't pay attention, it actually means that every time that happens, you're getting a pay cut. Yeah, you are. You're getting a pay cut in a variety of things. It may not be directly in terms of like your, your employers coming and telling you, hey, I'm dropping 15% of your salary, but it's happening to you indirectly. So the price of commodities, most commodities are paid in, are paid in US dollars, oil, mm -hmm. petrol. So yes. we're buying that in US dollars. So if the price continues to go up for diesel, kerosene and everything else, your salary hasn't changed. But if the currency depreciates 10% that month, Mm -hmm. the price of petrol increases by 10%. So you as an individual are now paying 10% more for that price of petrol. It means if you're in the transport sector, people are gonna raise prices. So King Yamatatu, you find that the rate has changed. Uh, if you, someone is you know, moving goods from country to country uh, or from you know, one town to another, the cost of moving goods from Nairobi to Nakuru has increased because the price of petrol has increased. So nobody is benevolent, they're gonna absorb that. They're gonna pass it on to you as a consumer. Mm -hmm. So you feel that effect. Last year, the Kenya shilling lost 23% to the dollar. So for all else being equal, we were getting almost 23% increase in imports or for anything that we were buying in, in dollars. Okay, and how does this impact the overall uh, wealth generation process? Let's say, for example, before we get to the mathematics of uh, lifestyle, mm -hmm. how does this, let's say, for example, the shilling losing at 23%, how does this impact your personal wealth? Oh, it does. So say you are getting, you know, 100,000 Kenya shillings for your salary per month. Okay? Yes. And January, uh, you know, January 1st, 2023, you are getting 100,000. And January, I mean, December 31st, 2023, you're still getting 100,000. In that time of the year, the currency has devalued 23%. So your 100,000 is now worth 23% less. It's no longer 100,000. It's 77,000. Yeah, it's 77,000 in purchasing power, okay? It's still not a 200,000, but what you can purchase in it is now equivalent to what you are do, purchasing for 77,000. So it means you have to cut what it is that you, you can't buy the same items. So you have to start reducing your expenses. You know, you have to be very cognizant of that because of that loss in expense. Now that is compounded by interest rates and everything else. So, you know, you, you will really feel the pinch. And so does this mean, what, what's the strategy, strategy to beat this? Does this mean that people should learn how to be stingy according to Forex? <laughs> I'm not paying my rent before this number goes down. Like, how do you manage? Well, unfortunately, we can't do that huh? because your landlord is going to knock on your door. Huh? But don't be a shida si pesa. Pesa do shida ni That's a good defense. That's shida si pesa. That's true. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the predicament I'm in. Huh? And thankfully, yeah. I have a good landlord who I'm, who I'm flexible with. So if I yeah. pay him tomorrow when it's better for me, all, all 
all good and well as long as he gets his his equivalent in KES. So, but unfortunately, people are not able to do that. Now you can negotiate with the shopkeeper on on forex because then even that hoarding, you know, uh, also impacts the the forex. Ah, so does it mean uh, for someone to enjoy the benefits of the exchange rate in the event that? Uh, let's say the dollar is strengthening, you have to have access to foreign, uh, as in dollars coming in, not locally, because you would have, locally you would have to exchange your KES to dollars, yeah. right? But if you have dollars coming in as dollars, that's how you get to enjoy the benefits. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's a simple supply and demand aspect, and I don't want to you know, boil it down to that, but we pay more for dollars if there's a shortage of dollars in the market. Mm -hmm. If there are more dollars coming in, then we pay less for that. You know, that's just one factor, it's the access of dollars in the market. The other factors are things that the government is doing to incentivize dollars to come in. So the current administration or any other administration, if they're not sensitive to what they're saying mm -hmm. and scaring off foreign direct investment, then we as individuals suffer. So if you have you know, uh, the president or the vice president or anyone else you know, saying things that destabilize confidence, it makes it more difficult for investors to come in. And there are a variety of reasons why that would be the case. If there's an unpredictable tax policy, for example. Uh, so investors are like, you know, I'm not really sure whether if I come and I set up business there, what my tax policy or what the tax policy will be next week or next month or, or six months down the line. Because businesses want predictability. It's okay. very hard to forecast if yes. you don't have predictability. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have predictability, then me as an investor, I'll say, you know what? Let me go invest my dollars someplace else, and then the market you know, dries up. Thankfully, we don't have any foreign currency restrictions like other countries like Malawi or Nigeria do. It's a willing buyer, willing seller when it comes to Forex, at least in Kenya. Mm -hmm. But it still means we still need the supply. If there is no supply, then you know, it will become more and more expensive. Now, thankfully, there's, uh, there's, we've, made, we've paid the euro bond. So people are not frantic as to whether we need to hoard dollars. So it's why the Kenyan uh, shilling is appreciating against the dollar. Mm. And when you mention holding, 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 does it mean um, I'm safer saving my money in dollars than saving it in any other currency? I would say you're safer saving it in a reserve currency if you have access to a reserve currency. If okay? you have access. It's the same principles that you would use in any other thing. Whatever, when it comes to savings or investment, yes. whenever yes, yes, you yes. invest in something or whenever you save in something, you want to save in something that appreciates in value, not depreciates in value. So if I ever have the equivalent of 100,000 mm -hmm. US dollars for my, as an individual, I will not hold it in KES because if you look at how the pattern is going, it's very unpredictable. And at least until very recently, it has... KES has been losing value. We wake up, it's 150 next week, 155 until... So if you're holding that equivalent, you're losing value in, into it. So even when you convert it into dollars or when you convert it to another currency. If, however, I'm holding in dollars or another similar reserve currency, the pound, the euro, uh, um, or any other one, then you have a much more stable uh, currency. And that's why at least commodities and, and goods worldwide are traded in US dollars. It's not necessarily because everybody likes Americans. It's more because the dollar is stable yeah. yes. and people trust the dollar. And mm -hmm. when there's a lot of unpredictability, what do people do? They be like, hey, watch on your channel in a KES or Ugandan shilling or Malawian yes. kwacha, let me store my money mm -hmm. in dollars. Mm -hmm. It's also affected by interest rates. The Federal Reserve in the United States raised interest rates, which meant if I'm saving in the United States, I'm getting better returns. So what am I going to do? I'm going to remove the money from the central bank here in Kenya and saving and put it in you know, Federal Reserve notes or other equivalents because mm -hmm. I get a better return for my money. Okay. It's, it's a good storage of value. Let me put it that way. Good storage of value. Yeah. Ah, sawa, sawa. Before we get into budgeting, uh, please break down a concept you mentioned um, for us. The value of time and why you said, Ama, why you believe poverty is very expensive. It's very expensive to be poor. Yeah, so it's very expensive to be poor for, for a variety of reasons. The first part is that it robs you of time. Okay. Not that poor people are the richest people, <laughs> like in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, the, the first shall be last type of thing. Yeah, well, yeah. that's the goal that eh? we want to, in terms of those principles, particularly when it comes to humility, yes. yes, yes. Uh, but what we mean is that by poverty being expensive is that it robs you of 
disposable income. It robs you of your time. So you have to work a lot longer mm -hmm. for the same things that you and I can buy. Um, so if I'm making 100,000 and you're making 50,000, you have to work twice as much to buy the same product that I will buy by that particular value. So if I'm buying something that's 10,000, the price could be the same, but you worked twice as much for it. Some people worked three times as much for it. Others worked five times as much for it. Now, the problem with that is that time is 24 hours regardless of whether you're rich or poor. So if you're working a lot longer for that, then it becomes expensive because what is money? It's just we convert it back to time and our earnings, the sweat of the brow. That's how we boil it down to it. Huh? That's why you're paid a salary for exchange of your time. And the salary that you're paid, you know, really dictates your purchasing power. So a higher salary, more purchasing power. A higher salary, less time that I have to work for something. So for a lot of people, you can say, you know, for someone like me, you can take the money that I make in a year, divided by how much I pay in rent or mortgage, and say, oh, he's only working 0.5% of his time for that house. Someone else may be working 30, 40, 50, 60% of their time for the same house or even a lesser house. So that's what I meant by you know, poverty being expensive, particularly not only to the individual, but also to the society, because now in the society you take all that aggregate of all those you know, losses in time, and it becomes very expensive for a country as a whole. So the, it's an economic loss because you can convert time to um, economic losses. So think of it as a poor person um, and how much you spend in transportation costs and also how much time you sit in transport, largely, uh, because of you don't have other means of transportation, okay? That's your time as an individual. Somebody may be sitting two hours in traffic, okay? But you have a whole matatu of people sitting two hours in traffic. Assume that matatu has 30 people. That's 30 times two. That's 60 hours of loss time for country as a whole. Now, how many matatus do we have on Thicker Road? You start converting that and it becomes a burden to society and a burden to the country. Because if we were to invest, for example, in better infrastructure, better education systems, and otherwise we can save a lot of time that we lose in multiple different things. And time is of economic value. Because now if I give you back two hours every day, what are you gonna do with that time? Spend it with your family, yes. Probably be more innovative because you have time to think, trial stuff. So it becomes a loss for the individual, but a loss for the society as a whole. So basically, uh, the true definition of wealth could be the uh, amount of money you make per unit time invested. Yes, that could be one definition. Huh? For me, I like to use it, for me on a personal aspect, I like to think of wealth as how much time it buys me in terms of freedom. Okay? How much time do I get to do the things that I enjoy mm -hmm. relative to, mm -hmm. to work? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not just talking about hobbies, driving cars. I'm talking about, you know, spending time with family, going to church, you know, investing in my mind, in reading and, 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 and stuff like that. You see, poverty is expensive because it's not just the time, but it's what you can do with that time. So there are people who do want to go to school, but they're just robbed of the time because they're poor. Okay. Because they can't pay for the school fees, which equates to time. Ah, yeah. ah. And how do you get to this place uh, of um, achieving purchasing power, achieving freedom? How do you get there? Because, uh, le let me just go directly. What's the practicality of saving? That's a good, good question. So the practicality of saving is, one, as we mentioned last time, it's an insurance policy against a rainy day, which will happen. You may fall sick, you may get hit by a car, an errant bona boda who was on the phone may you know, come and sideswipe you. So there's that particular aspect. But beyond the accidents and the things you can't plan for, it allows you to reward yourself in things that you may find valuable to you. So one, there's the safety net of it for yourself in the future. There is not having to worry about whether or not you will put a roof over your head or put food on your table for yourself as an individual, perhaps for your family, if you have a family, for your kids, if you have kids. It gives you a lot of, um, uh, I wouldn't say happiness, but at least it reduces the amount of worry that you have because there are rich people who are not happy. So I wouldn't necessarily say that 
money equals happiness, but money buys you the capacity, I would say, for happiness because it reduces some of the pains that you may experience in life. Mm. And uh, my friend who I quote a lot, God Semelang, who will also be in our guest on our show, he believes that you cannot save your way to wealth. And I think if you're poor, it's, it's difficult to save that. And we can get that on the, for, on the formula aspect because remember last time we spoke about you know, disposable income. Yes. Okay. So there, if you were to divide, you know, think of a table uh, that has a pie in it. Uh, and that pie is the amount of money that you have. Okay. And everything is portioned for. Uh, there's yes. a slice for food, a slice for shelter, a slice for uh, clothing, education, and elsewise. Some people have very small pies. So it doesn't matter how they divide that particular thing. It's just not, not enough. You'll never be able to yeah. save. You'll never be able to save. So if I'm telling you, like we'll get to later, that you should save 20% of your income, mm -hmm. and even if you are to take 100% of your income and pour it into your rent, you're barely making it. So for me, that's a fallacy. You're going to tell me, David, you don't know what you're talking about. I can never get to 20% you know, um, savings. Use another example. So I work in development, as you're probably aware. Uh, in West Africa, one of the policies that we tried was getting young children, especially girls, to go to school. Because in portions of West Africa, uh, girls were not going to school. But why were they not going to school? It's just because no parent wakes up in the morning and says, Okay, Because okay? every parent, at least a reasonable one, you know, as Jesus said, even your, God, uh, your earthly fathers know how to give good gifts. Huh? You know, they, they want the best for their kids. Yeah. So you have to ask yourself, why would a parent not send their kids to school? There's an underlying reason why. Usually it's time and economy. So if I send my kid to school, we may go hungry because this boy or this girl is not out in the field working in agriculture or raising cattle or whatever. So what do development partners do? They would come and would figure out what's the average earning salary for a young girl at the age of 13. And you give that family that salary in food because they're actually working for, for food. So how much does she work? It's 10 bags of rice, you give them 10 bags of rice. And all else being equal, you'll find that that family, now that you have solved that particular issue why their kid was not going to school because they were working, will now put that young girl or young boy to school. Mm -hmm. okay. So there are situations like that where people they just really don't have a choice when it comes to earnings and capacity and what they can do with their money. Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to save. There's frivolous spending, and we can talk about that later on, but then there is just being denied the capacity. And that's why you would get a comment like that, you're not able to save your way out of poverty because you don't have any savings Mm. To, to put together mm. so you can invest mm. and have them mature so that you don't have to be poor. So the idea of starting small could be a lie to some extent, uh, or a, a fallacy, or uh, next to impossible in this sense. Let's say uh, someone who earns 10,000 shillings a month and they have a dream of one time uh, investing and becoming an investor. If they can't access the big money, it is not possible. Yeah, it's not possible in that particular example. Uh, though I would venture to say that with very few instances of like really extreme poverty, on average, anyone can save. Because saving is simply just what we would convert to an opportunity cost. I say, I'm gonna put my money aside that I could otherwise spend for this, you know, for a larger picture or a bigger goal. So if you're earning 10,000, can you, shillings, um, there are some really difficult conversations that you have to have with yourself. Part of that is, where am I living? Do I have the capacity to live there? Am I absorbing a lot of these problems simply because of where I want to live and who I want to hang out with? Okay. My aunt retired making 14,000 Kenya shillings per month in Yahururu. That salary is largely unsustainable in Nairobi. But even though it was difficult, it was largely sustainable in Yahururu. So for her, she had the bandwidth to say, you know what, I can't live in Nairobi. This is my field, this is where I can choose there, and this is where I can save. And that's why I say, I think each of us has the capacity because for a lot of us, then there is abject poverty, 
and I don't want to generalize and say that everyone in Kenya is abject poverty, but a vast majority of us are in situations of poverty from the actions that we take by not budgeting accordingly, by frivolous spending, by utilizing resources as if that it will always be there, you know, um, and not taking advantage of that. A large part of that, and this is a societal problem, could be based on, you know, the basics that we are taught about money and access to money in school. It could be from parents, it could be from heritage, it could be from my own, you know, stupid decisions that I've made, you know, I decided to buy a V8 instead of investing in my college, you know. I would say for a variety of our users, mm -hmm. some of the problems that they have um, are from just not budgeting accordingly. And the reason behind that could be a variety of things. Yes. But be that as it may, you can still get out of that situation for a variety of people. Not everyone, but I'd say thankfully for a bigger proportion of people. There are some people who will need more social intervention at the policy and government and NGOs level in order to be able to pull themselves out of that. They will need help. And that's why government policies are important in that. There are others, like you, King Ori, I'll say, you don't need government help, you just need to plan better. <laughs> you know, stop eating at Charlie's Bistro every night. Ah! You, <laughs> you, you will save more of your money. But then, uh, we, we have abject poverty, you've said. We have people who are in, let's call it situational poverty. Yeah. Poverty like based term, on right? decisions. You write know? a paper on that. <laughs> I'll try. Yeah. Uh, poverty based on decisions, right? Mm. And I think this is a very tricky area. Before we get to, let's define this person who's poor by decisions and how they can change uh, and the steps they need to take. Uh, in the world of today, I wonder how you've maintained your relationship with God, right? And still are making serious both moves. How does that happen? Because uh, the people who are in abject poverty are blamed to some extent that it's because of God focus. People, mm. who, yes, yes, yes. You're focusing so much on God that you forget to work. Yeah. And the people who, uh, there are people who, have, who, are, who are successful, who do not believe in God, yet, uh, things work. So there's a, there's a line between survivor bias and principles of apply, certain principles that you apply that guarantee success. Yeah. Please tell us where the line is. So it, it, it's true, at least looking at the data, but then of course you have to break down the data to what it means because just because you, know, you come up and you say, you know what, uh, when we have forest fires, I think they're caused by ice cream sales. You know? And someone will be like, but how is that so? Well, because when ice cream sales goes up, forest fires go up. But as we say in statistics, correlation does not imply causation. The reason why ice cream sales go up is because people usually buy ice cream when it's hot. And when it's hot is usually when forest fires happen. The two are completely aye, aye, un aye, un aye. unrelated. In this particular aspect is that what do you do if you're pushed to your back, you know, as we say in English, between a rock and a hard place. Huh? Doesn't mm -hmm. matter who you are, you've suddenly become a little bit religious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? uh -huh. As you start praying prayers, so God, 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 if you, if, if you get me from here, I'll never drink again, huh? mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, or, or whatever. Yes. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that religious people are poor, it's just that poor people are more religious if that makes sense. Uh -huh, uh -huh, <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Carry on. And carry rich on. people mm -hmm. are less religious, and that's why Jesus said it's harder for a rich man, it's, it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Why? Because we're human beings. There's something called ego. Uh, once I get to a particular point, I start forgetting what got me there. That's so does this mean that some, you may argue that sometimes God refuses to bless poor people because he can see that the prayers are a prank? No, 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 not necessarily, because it, it's a good one. <laughs> you, you want to put words in my mouth that it didn't say. So remember, there's a parable where Jesus is talking, uh, you know, to the Pharisees, and um, there's the, the lady who comes and uh, cries and, and breaks a bottle of alabaster and puts it on her feet, and the, the, the rich say, you know what? Ah, we could have sold that perfume for a lot of money and mm, given it to mm, the poor. Mm, and Jesus' mm. rejoinder is like, the poor will always be with you. And the point there is, 
just by lottery of life. There are people who will be born poor. They have no picking that they were born in, you know, in the desert. There are people who are born in Darfur. All they have known is war and pestilence. Yes. Out of nothing. There's King Charles. He had nothing to do with him getting to that position of influence. It's just where he was born. Mm. Um, when people make it in general terms, you know, it's something that I have to do for myself. You know, St. Paul says, I must die daily to the flesh because utanza kusema ni mimi ni mejiweza. And for me, I remind myself when I didn't have. I remind myself of my uh, 11th grade algebra teacher. If it wasn't for her, I would not be in finance because I was very poor in mathematics. You know, and it was someone who took a chance in me and said, you know, David, it's not your lack of intellect, it's just your application that you need to do. And stayed behind with me to work on those formulas until I got it. If she hadn't done that, I wouldn't be where I am today because math just didn't make sense. Yes. Uh, but if now I forget her and not give thanks to her or give thanks to God for her, then I've missed the whole entire thing. And that's what I feel a lot of rich people do or people who have a lot of, I wouldn't say rich, but capacity. Yeah? You, you start thinking of it as because of your strength and your might. Mm. Uh, and for me, I say, if I have reached far, it's because I have stood on the shoulders of giants who have allowed me to extend my reach. And it's something that we have to do to individuals as a society in general. So the poor person remembers God in their time of need. Mm -hmm. And I would say God answers those prayers more readily because they're genuine and they're crying at a point of need. Well, some of us, uh, we only remember God when it's end month and we have been frivolous with our spending and you're like, oh my God, please. Need get me out of this order, you know, yeah. situation. And God will tell you, well, you know, you reap, reap what you sow. <laughs> you know, thankfully he's forgiving and, and, and remembers us. Yes, yes, yes. And now talking about that, uh, we, I'd like you to explain to us the concept of affording uh, so that we can break down the idea of situational poverty, mm -hmm. like poverty that you put yourself into. Mm -hmm. And I'll start by quoting one of my favorite pieces I've ever read on the nation newspaper. Uh, where these, um, in a car column, they were saying that earning half a million Kenya shillings, you cannot afford a, a V8. That's the land cruiser. We call it a V8, but that's the engine. Uh, you cannot afford a V8. What does it mean to afford? And let please break this down for us as we go into situational poverty. Yeah. So there is affordability in terms of what economists and finance experts say on what you should spend percentage-wise on certain things. Yes. Okay? There are things that we all need, whether we are rich or poor. We need a roof over our head. Um, it doesn't matter the size of the roof, but we need to be away from the elements. We need food for sustenance. Huh? Uh, you can have all the money in the world, but if you're not able to convert that money to sustenance, it's of no good to you. Okay? Yes. Um, and so there's this you know, 50, uh, 30, 20 rule uh, that becomes a very good general guidance for when it comes to budgeting. And what that does mean? It means that 50% of your income should go to basic needs. And what are these basic needs? It's food, shelter, clothing, you know, transportation, and all these other things that you need. 30% um, of your income should go to discretionary spending. That's the V8 part. So the V8 is not a need. Transportation may be a need for you to go in to and fro from work, but that transportation doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be a V8. Uh, very few reasons why anyone would need a V8. Okay. Uh, you usually have one, one for status symbol. Uh, my, my dad has one because he is in construction and he needs to pull material with it, uh, my father-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he can't do that with a V6 or a four-cylinder because he can't pull a 30-ton trailer with that. So there are very few instances where someone would, would need that. Um, but you still have to ask yourself in, in terms of capacity. Can I afford this? Because more than likely, a V8 is discretionary spending. And that goes to that 30% of your income that falls under discretionary spending. Would I use 30% of my income to buy a V8? Uh, I mean, 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a strong word, you know, if, unless I'm stupid, but I would have to consider it readily because I'd have to ask myself, yes. if I'm using 30% of my income for mm-hmm. this vehicle, what is the opportunity cost for that decision? Okay? And by opportunity cost, I mean what is foregone by making that V8 purchase? Is it school fees for my kids? Is it my rent? Is it time that I would otherwise enjoy? You know? And if you're comfortable with that cost, then by all means, buy the V8. I think a lot of people, however, don't really evaluate the opportunity cost. And opportunity cost, we're just meaning what is foregone by making this decision. Okay? That that is foregone is the opportunity cost. And you have to evaluate that within the context of it. So another example in practicality, you can pay a higher rent, but be closer to your job. And if that's the case, usually in Nairobi, a higher rent being closer to your job means there's some things you have to sacrifice. Is it now you go higher rent in Kilalesho from a two to, from a three bedroom to a two? Are you willing to sacrifice that extra bedroom that you probably would be able to get on Thika Road if you have a family of five? Those are all decisions that you have to make for yourself. Um, And once you evaluate those, then it becomes now a question of affordability. Uh, Can I afford this based on the outcomes that I want for myself? And then on the 50, 30, 20 rule, the last part, 20% is, is saving. So 20% 20% of your income should be saved and invested as a rainy day or in other aspects, money market funds or multiple other things. Um, and that's just a general rule. Now, the general guidelines, they may ebb and flow for different people. Some people may need to save a lot more than 20% because their goal is to buy a house or to pay for school fees or to do something else, which means that they need to put a lot more money into it. Some people may pay more than 30% of their income in rent because for them, like me at the time, as I mentioned last time, being closer to my job was more important in the time that I didn't stay in traffic. So for me, I valued that extra one hour per day that I was getting and I was willing to pay $1,000 per month for it because my $1 multiplied by 20 days was a lot more valuable to me than the $1,000. Ah, yeah. right. So um, it means, say, for example, um, you, the, the choice uh, between moving, these are the mathematics you need to make, moving closer to your job, you can drop the car and decide to save that money for something else. And also, uh, in terms of um, the sacrifices you need to make, saving should not, uh, savings should be targeted. You can't do blind savings. Would this help? That's why I asked about the practicality of saving. Like, you, if you save with a goal, it's easier to work towards that and be consistent yeah. than just saving to have money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, um, you know, goals without action are just, you know, uh, pointless. Huh? So a goal is good. It's a starting point huh? because you're working towards something. And uh, for a lot of us, I would say that makes a lot of sense. Because usually when you tie something to a goal, you're more inclined to follow it through. You can say, I want to lose weight. That by itself, you know, if you're overweight, may not be helpful. I want to lose weight so that I can be more healthy. I want to lose weight so that I can be able to play football with my kids. I want to lose weight because so that of, I can fit you know, in my tattoos. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> fit in my tattoos. <laughs> 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 yeah, especially with the 14 features. Huh? Yes, it's yes. hard for me to fit in one, in one of those as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So now the, 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 the other thing now becomes um, utilization of money. But before we talk utilization of money, there is the. So can we clarify that there is nothing like I'm now ready to buy a car? It is why am I buying a car? There's no levels. It's about yeah. what your percentages accommodate and why you're doing what you're doing in the yeah. first place. Why is important? not just in budgeting and savings, but in life in general. I think a lot of the problems that people face is because they don't articulate for themselves the why. Mm -hmm. So let me give an example. We live in a society that tends to be very conservative, the Kenyan society and Africans in general. And usually when you get to a certain age, whether you're a man or a woman, Mm -hmm. people start telling you things like, you should get married, or you should settle down, you should have a family, all very important. Mm -hmm. I married myself. But you have to articulate for yourself 
the why. Because if you're just getting married because your parents told you to get married, because after the wedding day, your parents are gone, everybody and the accolades are there, then you're starting to say, oh my gosh, I wasn't confident in myself, now I've brought someone else in my life, you know, the problems are compounded. When it comes to budgeting, the same particular thing. So when it comes to uh, buying or moving, you have to ask yourself why, and that why has to be articulated. A large part of the problem is we are not honest with ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. it's an aspect of denial is, and there's nothing wrong with saying I want a V8 because I love how it drives, okay? That's okay, that's your why, as long as you're able to articulate it. Uh, mm -hmm. But most of the times is, I want a V8 because I saw so-and-so driving a V8, and you didn't conceptualize for yourself whether it's the right decision for you. I have a lot of my friends who have bought V8s, and then come later and say, my, hey, hey, si kujui na kunyo I've, like, had, <laughs> I've had that too. Yeah. So two people, uh, two people, one who wants a, a big vehicle, a V8, let's use a V8 for example purposes. One wants it because someone else has it. Another one wants it because they love how it drives. It's an innate need, innate need for, uh, for the V8. Yeah. These two people will have different experiences with that vehicle. We'll have different experiences with that vehicle, and even if it's an innate need. So for example, I have a V8. I like the sound of a V8. I like the power behind it. I utilize the car for a lot of things that it was built for. I've driven mine from Harare to Nairobi, taken it off-road, gone and climbed Mount Meru with it. So there are a lot of things that I do, but I do that because I love safaris. I love being out on the road. I love, you know, working on the car when it breaks down. And, you know, I, I get some sense of gratification for that. Yes. For other people, if you're not able to answer that for yourself, it becomes a little bit more difficult. But beyond answering it for yourself, just because you have the capacity doesn't mean you should do it. I think we got into this last time. I've had the capacity for a very long time to buy a V8, multiple V8s. It doesn't mean that I go out and I buy it. I mean, it's a ridiculous proposition. You know, there are a lot of more valuable things that you can do with it. And sometimes it's useful to be able to do something and then, yeah, I have the innate power to do so, but I won't do it because of one, two, three. So that goes back full circle to the why, you know, being able to articulate, why do I want a V8? And you answer all these particular questions and then you should have the why nots, you know, mm -hmm. and see which one wins out. Uh, and, and then we're using a V8, uh, but you know, we can use more practical terms in terms of, should I move from a studio to a one bedroom? Should I move closer to campus or farther away from campus? You know, should I marry this one or this one? You know, regardless of what it is, you have to be able to articulate for yourself the why and answer it. You know, at the end of the day, my dad said, God is not going to come ask you, why did you marry this one and this one? No, I created them all equal. It's for you to be able to articulate and live with that answer. So much to unpack there. Number one, <laughs> are you saying that the leading cause of situational poverty is ego? Ego in this sense, uh, you could live in a one-bedroom house, but because you want to match up to a certain standard, you'd rather suffer in a two-bedroom. I would say that, that you've hit the nail in the head on that. That Precisely. makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. And, uh, um, what's and the worst the part is some people don't know that they're suffering. Huh? This is the worst part of it. Huh? Yes. You know, you have your ego that got you to a two-bedroom. Mm -hmm. You can't make ends meet, and it's staring you in the face. The reason why you can't make ends meet is because you're living in this two-bedroom when you should be in a one bedroom because that's the reach of your, of your hand. You end up biting more than you should chew. Ah, yeah. Before we discuss utility value, uh, which you have touched on uh, in some of the things you've said, please, let's design a lifestyle, a practical lifestyle, for someone who earns 30,000, and um, let's make them a millionaire. Let's make them a millionaire? Yes, yes, yes. With 30,000? We can use the Kenya board. shillings or dollars? Yeah, uh, 30,000 <laughs> <laughs> 30, Kenya shillings. In dollars, that's already a millionaire. Yeah, in dollars, that's already a million. I had my yes. phone over here. So I, I, I do have, I did design some um, following that 50-20 rule and just okay. kind of breaking down to a few parameters. And can yes, we... yes, yes, you can use the board. Okay. So um, I have a few examples. I hope my writing is, is good. Yeah. That's a <laughs> problem. We can uh, edit with AI. Just edit with case. AI, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So we are doing, uh, it's uh, 50, uh, 30, 20, Ruler. Yes. That's what we're going to use, huh? That's yes. the title. So the first person is shillings 30,000. Okay? Yes, yes, yes. So shillings 
30,000. Yes. So if I'm earning this per month, yes. uh, it means that I should not spend on in general, it doesn't really matter whether it's 30,000 or 50,000. The rule is essentially is percentage wise. So yes, it remains yes, yes. the same. So I shouldn't spend more than 50% of my income on basic needs. And this includes, you know, rent, food, clothing, transportation. So in this particular case, that amounts to 15,000. 15, okay? yes. So I'll put this in parentheses, and that is shillings, uh, 15,000. And that's basic needs, huh? Okay. okay. Basic needs. So rent and everything should fit there. Yeah. So this would be, you know, rent, food, mortgage, clothing, transportation should fit there. Okay. And then you can break this down even further. So basic needs, there's some general rules as well. So because rent fits in over here. Yes. Okay. The question is, okay, how much of my total income should I spend, you know, in rent? Huh? So okay. we'll have it uh, first here in terms of rent. Okay. And the general aspect is you shouldn't spend more than 15 or this is rent or mortgage, which okay. may be very difficult to find a mortgage with 30,000, mm. but let me put it here. I was wondering why you mentioned mortgage in 30,000, <laughs> yeah. because we are already out of Nairobi, uh, we are in Nyauru. Yeah, okay. but let, let, me just, yeah. let me just put it there. So you shouldn't spend more than 15%. Huh? So this becomes, you know, uh, 15 to 30%. Okay, so okay. in this particular case, in this example that we're using, mm -hmm. uh, I have my math over here, that becomes between shillings 400, I mean 4,500 and, and 9,000. Huh? So let me- Earning a, a salary of 30,000, the maximum yeah. rent you should pay is 9,000 shillings. Yeah, the maximum, so let me just put the maximum. Huh? Yes. Uh, that's, that's the max. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that. So yes. that's the max that you should pay in rent. Huh? But okay. it should be anywhere between 4,500 and 9,000. Huh? Doesn't yes, necessarily yes. mean that because I can pay a maximum of 9,000. You pay need maximum. to live yeah, in a 9,000 house. Yeah. So then we go to transportation, huh? because you will probably need to get around. So transport, I'm sure my, you wonder why I was a, a college professor. So transport here mm -hmm. is another between 10 to 15%. percent i am just gonna put the maximum here. Okay. So the maximum here, uh, for that is roughly 3,000, huh? That's what I would say, yeah? If we're doing the... the That's the maximum yeah. you need to spend yeah. on transport. Yeah, let me put the maximum and the minimum. So I'm going to put, you know, shillings, you know, 3,000 here. That okay? is two trips in an Uber. The rest of the days yeah. you walk. Yeah, so that means you, you, can't, you can't be taking an Uber. <laughs> very, very, very good point. Uh, okay. Then we have savings, huh? Mm -hmm. And that is 20%. Okay, so 20% mm -hmm. of that is 6,000. 6, okay, then we have the 30 rule, which is the discretionary spending. Huh? Mm -hmm. The so, V8. Yeah, the V8. Huh? Discretionary. Discretionary. I hope I'm typing this all, all I mean, not typing it. You see how we've been. It's very legible. Yeah? It's legible. Yeah. Because how? So that is roughly 30%. And that is shillings, 9,000. All right, hopefully. I haven't been a teacher in a very long while. Mm, but okay. you are today, so, back in the game. So that will be the breakdown yes, of someone yes, yes. earning 30,000. So mm -hmm. the maximum you would spend on basic needs is 15,000. Mm -hmm. Your rent and mortgage should not exist, uh, 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 go beyond 15 to 30%, so the max would be 9,000. Transport, you're spending between 10 and 15%, so about 3,000. Savings, no more than 20%, saving uh, 6,000. Discretionary, uh, spending uh, 9,000. So if you were to uh, save this you know, uh, every, every month, uh, at yeah. least for the given year, uh, this 6,000 times 12 is 72,000. 72,000, uh, yes, yes, 72, yes. so yes, yes, yes. the person earning this should be able to save 72,000 per year. Now, assuming, not assuming, it's, you're not putting it under the mattress, so you're putting it in an investment aspect. So yes. if you're saving 72,000 uh, per year, yes, right, and then we compound it, put it maybe at, let's just put it at average 10%, so it yes, becomes yes, yes. very, yes, very, yes, yes. very easy. So, 7, you know, at 10%, yes. that's 7,000. 200 that you're getting in interest every month, huh? and it's mm -hmm. compounded and you're continually saving. Huh? If you do this, the average of you know, six years, uh, you, money starts to double. Now, 
money starts to double in six years. Yes, yeah, roughly about six years. And remember, we're not just looking at the first doubling, we're looking at the one much, much later. So at this particular one, at this particular average, somebody will have to run the numbers, mm -hmm. on a general lifetime, now if you're studying this when you're 50, you're definitely not gonna be a millionaire. But if you're studying this in your 20s, okay, then it's very easy at this particular one to hit a millionaire. Now, we're also making some assumptions. One, this is growing continually at a 10% per yeah. year. Yeah. Uh, interest rates in, in Kenya tend to be a little bit higher for CD or otherwise. Two, we're also making the assumption that your income will not be stagnant. And not the time be taxed. You're, yeah, okay, you're also gonna be taxed. Huh? Uh, so for this calculation, let's assume this is after taxes. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, a yes, little yes. Bit, you're a little bit higher. But we're also making the assumption that if you started this, say, when you're 20, by the time you're 50, your income has gone up. So if you just take average inflation mm -hmm. and you assume that your income goes up by 2 to 3%, over the course of, uh, you know, by the time you're 60, your income will be much, much higher than this. But remember, you're still saving okay. this particular aspect of 20%. So over time, uh, a million does become very realistic, but it's tied to saving right, and compounded interest. Okay. okay, consistently. Okay. okay. Now, once you get to a particular point, if you're not just putting all this money in your money market, if you do this for 10 years, then you probably have enough of a down payment to start putting aspects of a mortgage. Yes. Um, and then that mortgage eventually also appreciates in value, which goes back to your net income. Mm -hmm. yeah? Then that's how you become a millionaire. Maybe not necessarily in cash, but also in assets that you attain over that, that journey. In which, uh, in which uh, point, brings, uh, this brings us to the point of uh, this average investment, uh, return on investment of 10%, is this standard? Is it universal? Like um, if you put X amount of money down, right, uh, across the year playing around with this money, the most realistic return becomes 10%. So, yeah, for Kenya, that one would be a very realistic return. For the US, if you're investing in the stock market, that would be a very unrealistic return because the average S&P 500 is on average between six to seven and a half percent per year. So this would be a very risky investment. In Kenya, however, because of the way the interest rates are, this is it's realistic. So if you think of T-bills, 12%, uh, uh, transport infrastructure bonds, 16%, you can go and get a CD for anywhere between 12 and 14%, uh, depending on how much you're putting in. So this is actually a very conservative number. So yeah. for, for our purposes, you know, this is realistic. In which case, again, uh, the most realistic lifestyle for someone earning a net salary of 30,000, it means that literally, and you, do, you don't even have a family here, mm -hmm. you cannot even afford an Uber, right? Yeah, uh, because if your transport for total per month is 3,000, yes, yes, and yes, you yes. take a tr uh, 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 an Uber from, uh, you know, Garden Estate to town, yes, or yes, to yes. Kileleshua, maybe anywhere depending on the time. I'm assuming this person is going during rush hour. So that would be anywhere between 800 and 1,000. Huh? So that means you can only take, you know, so you, in, in, by the second day, this money is gone, okay? Yes, so, yes, yes. So, uh, yes, you can't. And that's where the discretion comes up. Huh? So you have to realize to yourself, okay, I want to go out on a date, show the girl a good time, so I'm going to take an Uber. Huh? But I have to subtract the cost from that, mm -hmm. and I know that next week I'm going to have to start walking. Yeah. Okay? So, yeah, and that's yeah, the yeah. thing that we don't do. Okay, mm -hmm. so we like, we want to keep up with the Joneses, you know, spend, you know, all this money when we know that we don't have enough to go around. And this doesn't matter when, you know, if I change that to, you know, 50,000 and the percentages, you know, remain the, same. remain the same, we'll just be adding these numbers a little bit more. Uh, but even at 50,000, even at 70,000, probably would not be taking an Uber. But we have, uh, say for example, thank you for that explanation, yeah. I believe, uh, Nezendelia. Uh, we've had. Let me uh, put it back for the people who may come a little later and wonder why those percentages <laughs> are not making sense. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we, um, in my my previous um, line of work, mm -hmm. uh, or should I say, when I used to be at Nation, uh, we had stories of someone earning half a million. Not, and this is a person in case, someone earning half a million, but they are broke by the fifth of the month. Yeah. Right. But you have people with these uh, amounts of money, but they, they are good, they are good, they yeah. can manage yeah. all the time. Yeah. Uh, does it mean the difference, does, uh, the amount does not make sense? It's how you're disciplined to the percentages. I would venture to say, so my mom says something very well. She says, if you can't budget 100 shillings, even if I give you a million, you won't be able to budget it. Because mm -hmm. the principles yes. don't reflect on the amount, 
that principles are, are principles. You know, they apply the to principles you. Principles are standard. Yeah, are standard. They apply to you just as much as they apply to me. The only main difference is that based on our income, you and I may have different amounts of discretionary yes. spending. Yes, yes. But yes. the percentages are, are roughly, roughly the same. So going back to the V8 example, someone earning 3 million Kenya shillings per month probably can't afford a V8 because 3 million Kenya shillings per month becomes, you know, uh, 300,000 that they can put towards transport. Mm -hmm. So if they buy a V8, you know, they're, 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 in, they're in good hands. But if you're earning 100,000 and your 10% is 10,000, mm -hmm. you know, it makes it very difficult to afford a V8. Or even sadly, any car for any general, actually. Sadly, sadly, a V8 going for 20 million, I'm sure the monthly costs are way, way above 300,000 yeah. in terms of the payments, yeah. the car payments. You've not counted insurance. You've not counted uh, repair cost. Yeah. So still that goes, uh, that takes us back yeah. to who can really afford yeah. such a lifestyle. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I tell, I joke around with my friends, huh? and I say, at the level that we are, there's some things that you should not finance. Huh? Because if you're financing, it's a very good e example that you can't afford them. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who have to finance simply because even the little, they, they, they can't uh, do it. Uh, if you're making a million and you're financing a V8, the question I would ask you is, do you really need a V8? Because there are multiple other cars that you can buy without having to finance. So if you're able to articulate for yourself the why, all good and well. But I think for a good bit of people, um, even the financing, and especially if they're not doing the month, they're buying the utility of the car, it feels good and everything else, but it's a depreciating asset. That mm. car is worth less the moment you drive it off the lot, particularly in a place like, like Kenya where the cars we're getting are anywhere from you know, eight three, years. six, you know, eight years old. So the car has really depreciated. So it is not an asset in terms of an investment. It's, it's a loss. The car is much older, so it has more wear and tear, more mechanical costs. Uh, you know, insurance is high. Mm -hmm. um, so they, there are a lot of these factors that I think a lot of people don't look at. In which case, does it mean that the car you drive, for you to be able to sustain your lifestyle, all the costs associated, associated with that car should fit within your transport percentages. Oh, yeah, yeah, and that's what a lot of people don't do. Huh? They, they, they don't put, you know, they just put buying the car. They don't put the insurance and everything, the fuel, into the yes. transport. Huh? It has to fit yeah. within 15%. Yeah. So it has to fit within 15%. And, and 15% is the, is, is, the max. Is, is, is the max huh? uh, you know, if you're always going to the max on everything of these other ones, you know, it's ebbs and flows. So if you're spending 30% mm -hmm. total on rent, you probably should not spend 15% max on transport, mm -hmm. uh, because eventually you're going to start cutting from other, other, other areas. And this is mathematics of an individual, because when it comes to family, then the mathematics changes. You have school fees, you have other yeah. needs that come yeah. with the Now, school fees fits up there on the basic needs. Uh, so basic needs should not go beyond you know, 50%. 50%. Uh, um, as a general guideline, for others, they may go beyond 50%, but if they do, you have to take, because it's a piece of pie. Huh? If I give you more than 50% of the pie, someone okay. is going to go missing. If I'm okay with whoever goes without, then we're okay. So, um, but you just have to be true to yourself. I think that's what a lot of people don't do, is that, okay, yeah, I'm going to spend 30% um, of my income on rent, but what will I do without by doing that? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. most people don't answer that question and they come to find out after they have made the spending because I'm like, hey, mm, mm, by the way, mm, 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 you know, mm, mm. Yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> right. yes, yes, yes. Uh, this joke people talk about, gas always has the element of surprise. So if you live by these principles and you get the benefit of time in terms of building up uh, or loading up with your finances, nothing catches you off guard unless unforeseen circumstances yeah. like... Yeah, in, in general terms, huh? nothing yes. catches you off guard. Now, by the way, some of these principles, though general guidelines, and maybe I would just use guidelines, not even principles, because principles sound more resounding, but guidelines uh, can be really difficult for someone who's making... 30K. Because I can tell someone who's making 30K, please don't spend more than 30% of your income on rent. But if you live in Nairobi, 
that starts to become it's a really tall order. So the question you have to have for yourself as an individual, uh, and that's why I'm saying you know, really truthful and factual conversation is, okay, do I need to be in Nairobi? And you, not because my friends are here or, oh, Ukuna Skianga Vizuri, they are good vibes. Yeah. You have to ask yourself, because you can make 30K in Nairobi and make 20K in Yahururu and have a happier life. But then, that, you know what's scary about that? Because uh, most security guards in this country earn 14,000 shillings in a month. Yeah. And they guard homes in Nairobi. Yeah. So does this mean they should be living in Machakos, like, so that they can be able to afford a certain lifestyle? As in, you, you have a job, you, you are guarding a house in Nairobi, mm-hmm. where you have to commute, you have to fit all these percentages in 14,000. Yeah. That is where we talk about abject poverty yeah. by default. Yeah, it, it's very difficult. I mean, if you're making 14K in, in Nairobi and you're commuting to Kilaleshwa, for example, um, that's going to be a very difficult, especially, um, and I don't know whether the, the companies organize, uh, you know, um, shared pooled cars or somebody's mm-hmm. getting for themselves. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yes, we can tell that person to go to Machaco's because it's easier to, for him to get a, a house there to rent, but mm-hmm. then the transport cost is, is in, inflated. Uh, but for me, to that particular person, you know, this is, and by the way, I'm generalizing. The question I would be having with them from an advice perspective is like, okay, you're making 14K. How does that pertain to your lifestyle? I mean, are you jailed to Nairobi? And these are things that we, we don't have. Um, sometimes we, we either take them for granted or because nobody ever asked us and so we never consider them. When I left the World Bank, I'm still in Washington, D.C., but one of the biggest things that we have had with my wife is the moving outside Washington, D.C. And we're moving outside Washington, D.C. not because we can't afford it, but my work is no longer there. So now we're asking ourselves, okay, do I want to pay 4500 per month in a mortgage when I can get it at another part of the country for 2,500. Why do I need to be in DC? Yes, DC is cool, the White House is there, but why do I need to be there if it doesn't make any more practical sense for me to be here? And so we've decided to move and we're moving. But that's a decision that we had to make for ourselves. You know, even me, I'm sitting here as a budget expert, I yes. still undergo through these problems. After a year and I said, hey, by the way, you know, yes. we've paid almost 60,000 in a mortgage Yes. Uh, when we could have rented it out yes, 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 and yes. Moved, moved some other place or sold the house entirely. Utility value. Utility value, yeah. Uh, in, uh, in which case, you mentioned Kileleshwa. The average cost of rent in Kileleshwa is around 70,000. Um, uh, for someone earning half a million minus the taxes, in fact, uh, at 500,000, the taxes kick in at 32.5%. Mm-hmm. Let's give it uh, a 30%, that means 350,000 for a blanket figure for mathematics sake. If you're living in Kileleshwa on a salary of 500,000, practically, you are suffering. Yeah, you'll be suffering. Um, and the, the issue for the person suffering is what you rob yourself from that suffering. Right? Because, you know, people don't realize that they're suffering. They think they're making it because at that particular point, they don't feel the pinch. But it's when they get to be 40 or 50 that they realize, oh my gosh, the compounded interest that I could have been earning that went, all I did was, you know, uh, enrich my landlord, but I didn't enrich myself. So You say this a lot, but you're a landlord yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you're not scared that your, your tenants will watch this. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not scared that my tenants will watch it. Well, okay, hopefully they're watching it. Uh, <laughs> but there will always be someone to rent, okay, yes. um, in, in most places. Uh, but rent unless, at your level. Yeah, rent at your level. Uh, particularly in a place where you have good scale development that meets okay. the needs of the populace or society, yes, there will yes, always yes. be someone who they can rent. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, for, so for me, in that particular aspect, for that g- gentleman or lady living in Galilee, who are earning 500000 it may feel like an affordable lifestyle, but mm-hmm. you're robbing your future self of earnings, of uh, time, because you could have worked until you're 50, but mm-hmm. now you're gonna have to work until you're 62. You know, or you're gonna have to do something else. Huh? And you know, unfortunately, people live like there is no tomorrow, especially us as young people. Is that, and it's a human aspect. It's a very harsh, 
hard for us to comprehend a time that I will not be able to work. Yes, yes, yes. You know, my parents as well. I'm the one who's telling my parents, hey, hey, guys, you all need to slow down, eh? Mm. You're not in your 30s anymore. You're approaching 70. I want you to start thinking. But they're still, no, 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 I'm, I have virility. I'm able to do so. And yeah. then I'm the one who's thinking, yeah, but you can't do this for more than 10 years. I mean, yes, yes, you know. Yes, yes. Um, and it's a frank conversation that we have to have with ourselves. And it's, people age. It's the reality of it. And let's plan for that aspect of it. Uh, and then uh, you mentioned marriage and planning at some point, right? So my, I, I'm very tempted to hear your point on, has the world, uh, the capitalism system, changed the original intention of marriage? That you have to be stable to get married. You know, marriage was about suffering together. Has that changed? <laughs> so, and the funny you said the word capitalism, and I remember the previous guests that you had here, and I love the way he was saying capitalism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. look, marriage for love is a new thing. I don't get me wrong. I don't want to be told to marry anyone, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I'm also realistic in that particular aspect. Um, marriage for love is a new thing. Marriage for love is a new thing. And by the way, but when I say that, I'm not talking about you know. In our lifetime, it, it's 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 been there, but. In the grand scheme of human history, yes. marriage for love goes back about 150 years, maximum. Before that, and even in some cultures today, people are not marrying for love. Now, it's interesting when you look at the statistics, okay? I mean, and I'm just talking about the statistics without generalizations. Arranged marriages in some societies have lower rates of divorce than marriage for love. The question becomes, for me as an intellectual, I ask myself why. If you're marrying for love, see, you checked off all the boxes in terms of what you wanted. So mm -hmm. you should have perfect compatibility. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so they should have marriage for love, should have lower rates of divorce than arranged marriages. But what do we do as human beings and as people in general is that we remove ourselves from planning, particularly when it comes in matters of love. Huh? Yes. I'm just blinded by love. You know, I'm like, you know, my dad says, I don't understand why people fall in love. Huh? And you, go, you, just, you just fell. Huh? Why don't you go into it <laughs> considerably thinking? Huh? Yeah, you're not blind. Yeah, huh? yeah. Uh, you start asking yourself, because I see a lot of young people, oh, he's very cute. You know, he's, uh, I, I love the way he, you know, he talks with his mouth full. Five years later, you're like, oh my gosh, that really drives me nuts. <laughs> you, make a very good, you make a very good case for ugly people. Nataka kuona my least story So, so the, the point I'm trying to make is this, is that, mm. so, in times past, yes. people married for security. Financial married security. for security. Okay? And that's, you know, in, in, in general. Huh? And so which I'm not saying is a good or a bad thing, I'm just saying that's what they that's did. That's what used to happen. Okay, that's what used to happen. Um, and as a result, what they valued was what provided me with security. So they evaluated character traits a little bit better than us who marry for love. Because if I'm marrying for security, I'm gonna be making a very diff different decision than if I'm marrying for love. If I'm marrying for security, I'm like, does that person have a steady job? Okay, yeah. left and right, you know, because I'm not just talking about financial security, I'm talking about personal security and everything yes, else. Yes, yes, yes. So you evaluate those very well, and then you make the decision. Now, most of the time, it was the family that made the decision. And maybe as a joke, I say, maybe it would be better if people made the decision for me because they would evaluate the things that me, I'm being blind to. Mm -hmm. uh, they would be yeah. like, hey, by the way, did you notice that your wife or your husband has this funny, funny traits? You're like, ah, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, whatever. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. later on, you're like, hey, it's, 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 it's true. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, because we utilize, as I said last time, uh, short-term pleasures to make long-term decisions. Look, there is something called, um, what is this uh, country? Uh, uh, when, when people are held hostages, um, yes, there yes. is an effect that mm -hmm. happens uh, mm -hmm. when you start identifying with your captor over time. Ah, uh, uh, syndrome. It's called yeah. something syndrome. Yeah, I have to, I'll get uh, it. Stockholm syndrome. Huh? Stockholm syndrome, yeah. yes. So if the Stockholm syndrome can happen and we're rational, 
And that's happening when you're under duress. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. Why can't I expect it to happen when I'm not under duress? So someone who is being kind to me and everything else, not while they're holding a gun to my face. Yes. It means that it will blind me to some character traits that I'm not seeing. So then individual, I say, uh, something that my father and my, and, and my, and my mom said, is that, you know, walk slowly so you never have to walk backwards. Okay? Because the little problems you ignore now will become your mountains much later on. So in, in closing, so my dad is an ordained pastor. And uh, one time he, um, he did a wedding. Uh, and before he uh, marries people, he always Ask comes and, and does them sure. to do, uh, no, he, he does premarital counseling. And my dad has a general rule, you have to sit with him or someone else at least three times, you know, uh, for your premarital counseling. Mm. So in uh, one it's sort of like an assisted break. An assistant, yeah. So in one of those, a, a very a good couple, um, who they started, they have been planning their wedding and everything else, they're very excited, so now they come to speak to the pastor. You know, and dad is telling, okay, so we will, this is how we will do the vows. And then the lady goes, no, 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 we can't, we can't do that. We can't do them like that. He's like, why? And then she goes, well, I'm Catholic. And then the gentleman goes, well, we have to do them like that. I'm Methodist. Dad asked him, how long have you all been dating? Go three years. In that three years, you never once discussed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the way, I'm Methodist. Yeah, yeah. I'm Catholic. Yes, yes. We will yes. get married. What will our vows look like? And we'll come yes. and go, oh, my favorite color is blue, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so we bury things under the rug. Mm -hmm. And they'll come up later. You know, and so that's why, you know, marriages for love have significant higher rates of divorce. Um, in the U.S., we're talking about, you know, six out of every ten marriages, you know, end up in divorce. And it's an awful statistic. And it goes back to what I was asking earlier on. You have to know your why. Because it can't be because my parents are telling me or you have to be able to articulate your why. Because your why will keep you in a relationship. You'll remember I got in here because of one, two, three, you know, mm. or, and, and, and that, that will keep you as opposed to saying, ah, no one told me it will be. This so if you, marry, if you marry for love without a purpose uh, based on what you can afford in this context of the world we live in today, it means you're injecting yourself with more poverty. Yeah, I mean, you know, whether it's any relationship or otherwise, business partner or everything else or marriage, our relationships are relationships, but you have to talk them through. Huh? There's some relationships that we don't have choice in. Huh? Your brother, your sister, you're born when I'm going with your brother, you have mm. no choice. Mm. These other ones, we get into them willingly. So if we get into them willingly, it will be good for us to have parameters or rules of engagement. I say, by the way, me, I want to drive a V8 anytime, you know? Your wife may say, I don't see any value in that, but because you love it and, and I'm whatever. And so you have those conversations. Huh? Someone may say, you know, me, I never want to live in Nairobi. You know, I came to Nairobi for school. When I get married, I want to. But people don't talk about these things. Huh? Uh, and, you know, we're generalizing here, but one of the biggest things that people don't talk about mm. is finances. And so you have finances as a significant problem in relationships, uh, marriage or otherwise, so because we don't talk about them. And so you have to budget for marriage. Yes, I mean, you have to, huh? you know, for me, it was a very difficult thing because I'd been so used to doing things by myself. Then I get married and we had been talking about this and then I make a decision. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know what? I should have. Should in, which have... Case, <laughs> in which case, you can technically yeah. say that poor people should be single. <laughs> I cannot afford just to be in a relationship. Just you bring your problem and I bring my problem. We do together. We compound the problem. Ah. Right? It doesn't become easy. You know, most people yeah. think, look, I'll say this, Our I, 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 tell, yeah, I tell my sisters and, and any young person this, you have to be comfortable with your own version in terms of singlehood mm -hmm. without the expectation that a relationship is going to solve the incapacities that you have. Because and mm -hmm. your incapacities are just more compounded. Someone is not coming to relieve the pressure of your own, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, of someone is not coming to relieve the pressure of your own 
you know, weaknesses. Uh. You have to address mm, 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 your mm. own weaknesses. Uh. Mm, you mm. can't make assume that I'm getting married so that my wife can come and fill this hole. Yes, yes, You'll yes. get married and that hole will still be there. And then it becomes a problem because now you have another problem. You have another person, you know, and you're all complaining about the same thing. Okay. So I tell people, marriage is not a panacea for your problems, okay? Mm -hmm. Deal with your problems. Don't bring them in to your marriage. Now, the ones that you find when you're there, uh, those are fine. You, you go through them together. But I think for a lot of us, we come into marriage or we come into relationships. Talk about business partners and everything. We come into relationships with a significant amount of baggage mm. and we expect that person to relieve that pressure. Uh, mm. No one is going to come in and complete your happiness. You have yeah. to be happy with yourself before you bring someone else in. I agree. That's uh, solid. Uh, before we talk uh, utilization, um, utility, we, we, you've mentioned utility value broken down. We may define it. Utilization of money is another thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we may need to talk about that. But please give us a breakdown for us the idea of, a, of purchasing power in this sense. Uh, when I look um, in my entertainment, let me give an example with entertainment. Mm -hmm. When I look at uh, the US, for example, the comedians I look up to, Akina Trevor Noah, uh, Kevin Hart, Dave Chappelle, uh, the way the, in which they measure success in that area is um, by selling out the Madison Square Garden, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, selling out the big shows and stuff. Uh, it, we could discuss popularity, we could discuss population ratio, but then mm -hmm. when you come to Kenya, however uh, famous someone is, they have a struggle selling out the Kasarani Stadium, even for a thousand shillings. Mm -hmm. Like you would struggle getting, most people would struggle getting 20,000 Kenyans to buy a ticket at say a thousand shillings, most people. It's possible. Uh, is it marketing strategies? Is it that we don't have enough Kenyans with disposable incomes to send income to spend in particular areas? So purchasing power, it's a very important aspect. In economics, there's something that we call purchasing power parity, which is you know, the differences. Um, so there are a lot of values that we use for measuring uh, income or the wealth of a country. GDP becomes the most common one, yeah. which is the total value of goods and services that a country produces. So the United States is up there with 25 trillion and so forth. But then mm -hmm. you take GDP and then you divide it by the population in that particular country. In the United States, you take 25 trillion divided by 355 million. Mm -hmm. And what you get is the average. Yes, okay. yes, yes. And that was we call something we call GDP per capita. Mm. Okay. So GDP divided by the population. Mm. But even then, it doesn't tell you much. Because, take a good example, you have Elon Musk, yes. who is at 200 billion. Then you have someone who is earning 40,000. And then you do the average of that. Yeah, yeah. And then I you make the, the assumption point. that the, the country is rich. But no, I it's just one person who is really pulling there. Average, yeah? mm. So to solve for that, econ yeah, economics, economists will use something median um, instead of average, yeah? mm, mm. which at least removes some of the noise. The scale, huh? yes. But then another thing that you can use is purchasing power. And then that has to be taken into consideration of one, what you're buying and where that product is. So uh, there tends to be a McDonald's in almost every country with the exception of Kenya. So one of the things that economists use is, you know, what does the cost of a Big Mac, which is the most common meal in McDonald's, cost you across different countries? And it will tell you the purchasing power. So you take a dollar in the US, you can't buy a Big Mac. You take a dollar in Kenya, you can probably die for Big Macs. BBC did a very good example by utilizing something that people commonly buy, bananas. And they showed what one dollar will buy you in bananas. So in Kenya, that's roughly uh, what, at the current exchange rate, 149 Kenya shillings, give or take. Huh? So how many bananas with 149 shillings buy you in, in Kenya? You know, 14, yeah. Yeah, a good bit. In, in the US, if you're going for organic, like what we would have here, they're probably anywhere between 60 cents a pound. So a dollar is not buying you a lot of bananas. Okay. Then you have and other countries in between. Huh? So that's how you define purchasing power. Essentially what it is, is like, let's agree on a common good that we will all typically tend to use, and we will see how much it costs to buy that thing across different countries. Okay. If a dollar, please, Nisipotea, if a dollar in Kenya can buy you almost 15 bananas, 
but the same dollar in the US cannot buy you five bananas. Does that mean that uh, the US, the cost of living, is this is why we talk about yeah. the cost of so living? So that shows the cost of living. Okay? So things are more expensive in the US from the cost of living. And that's why, you know, for you tell someone, you know, how much are you paying in rent? I mean, I, I have my tenants who moved in, uh, are moving in on April 1st, actually. So for one of the apartments that, that I have. And um, when you have tenants, and I think any, any landlord does, you want to find out where on their ability to pay. on the fast and you're knocking and no one is. So you ask them for their name, you know, your whole, what we call KYC, I know your customer details, and you ask mm -hmm. them for all that information. Yes. And then you ask them for their income, you know, you ask them for their debt, you know, all this is, and there are systems that use that. So by the time I sign a lease with someone, I'm able to say, okay, uh, um, Dr. Kengori is able to pay. Here in Kenya, sometimes it may be not difficult. You just go in there and uh, say, oh, I'm going to rent, you know, I want to rent this thing. Okay, just put two months deposit, and lafu, una lemoa later on. So in that particular case, uh, the example that I was giving, um, mm -hmm. I told my tenants, well, why don't you give me supporting documentation so that I can figure out whether you're going to be able to pay the rent. The rent is $4,900 per month. You asked your clients that? Yeah. yeah. Now I could catch. Huh? They did, not, uh, uh, they, they, they did not get angry. No, 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 it's, it's common standard practice. Common standard Yeah, practice. at least in the U.S. I, 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 in Kenya, it may not be so, but in the U.S., whatever mm -hmm. it is that you're buying, mm -hmm. somebody's going to ask you about your ability to pay, unless you're yes. paying cash value for it. Mm -hmm. okay, then there's mm -hmm. no ability to pay. Yes. But if I'm buying that laptop and I'm buying it on, on, um, on pay, pay as you go, me as a seller will want to know, yeah, you can buy it pay as you go, like in Utah as a Kulipa. Show yeah, me yeah. your proof yeah. of funds is what we yes. call them, uh, or proof of ability to earn funds. So I asked them for that, but you know what they did? They wrote me a wire transfer for the whole amount, for the whole year, okay? They threatened <laughs> you with the ability to pay, like you just told them to show you they can pay? Yeah, and they paid it the whole year in, in, in one sweep. Huh? Then now goes back to the budgeting. Huh? Now I've received all this lump sum in one thing. What do I do with it? I can go spend it, but I still have to pay the mortgage for that place, okay? Uh, so that's where the savings and everything comes into place. So you put yeah. it up. So that's money. For me, it's there in cash, but I'm locking it up in you know, something that's like a CD because I need it to pay my mortgage every single month. Yes, but, yes, yes. Um, uh, going back, and I lost your question a little bit earlier when we got to that particular Purchasing example. Power. Purchasing power. So in that particular example, that person was able to show me his purchasing power by paying the whole year in cash up front. Mm, uh, which brings to question um, the, uh, the Jay-Z's Quote, and I'm sorry I'm quoting Jay-Z to you. Uh, the I idea like Jay-Z. <laughs> yeah, I thought you only listened to Christina Shusho. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you can't buy it twice, you can't afford it. So, purchasing power is your ability to, to, to afford something long term. Yeah, it's your ability to afford something long term. Now, there are some things that we have to nipa pole pole, like a mortgage, mm -hmm. because otherwise, if we ask everybody to pay cash, they will there would be... Nobody, no, can, no, nobody would be or able very to, few people yeah, kind of... Yeah. So there's some things you finance. And mm -hmm. you finance for a variety of reasons. Affordability to the, um, you know, the time value of money. Mm -hmm. you know, being able to bring your future earnings forward. Being able to... Yes, I'm making 30000 now, but it's a 30-year mortgage. So it means if I just assume I'm going to be increasing in purchasing power over time... 10 years from now, David will not be earning 30,000, they'll be earning 40,000 or 50,000. But the mortgage, at least the purchase price is not changing every year, it's mm -hmm. set as, you may know I want to come in 30 million, that's it. Mm -hmm. Of course you have the interest calculations and things to go by. So those you spread out and you bring your future purchasing power here so that you can buy that mortgage. Mm -hmm. But there are some things that you don't need to do that with. And I gave the example of, of the car, at least you know, last week I told you about my friend who um, loaned me some money so I can uh, pay out the house, I mean pay out the car. I could have gone and got a loan for that, but mm -hmm. it didn't make sense for me in where I am, you know, in terms of my growth in resources. It didn't make sense for me to go get a loan for $2.6 million. Uh, it's, I calculate the whole interest and everything else. I'm like, you know, it's just better off paying cash and you're done with other things. 
However, there are some things where I will use the bank's money because I can calculate and say, you know what, it's better for me to use the bank's money because I can pay slowly over time and inflation is in my favor. And so technically, I am saving money in the long run. So even in the idea of using other people's money, does not mean you use other people's money for everything. No, not for everything. You use, it, you use other people's money when it... On when most it of the times, I use... You. Yeah, when it benefits you. On most of the time, because other people's money is costly. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask yourself, are you willing to pay that cost to use their particular money? Okay. If it's of benefit to you in terms of your planning, by all means, yes. Okay. Going back to the Forex conversation, of course. If I'm able to get a loan in KES, why would I not get a loan in KES when I know that the dollar is going to be appreciating more than the KES? So for me, that loan, even what can you be, let me use a very good example. If I had gone in a loan last year for 100,000 uh, in, um, in KES, okay, and I was using dollars to buy that same loan, okay, January 1st, 2023, I get 100,000. I have to pay that back, 100,000 plus interest on December 31st, 2023. So say they had given to me at 14%, just as an example. Um, I would need to pay 114,000 back to the bank, okay? But what was the loss of the dollar to the KES? It was 23%. So if I am getting that same loan and I know I can get access to that dollar a year later, that 100,000 is now 100,000 minus 23%. So technically, in dollar terms, you're I'm paying 23% less. You're paying 77,000. Yes, paying 77,000. Even if I add the interest, which is 14%, 14 okay, I'm yes. still left with 14, that is 7, 10%, uh, 9% gains in my favor. So you've paid a loan in negative interest. I paid a loan in negative interest. So technically, I, in that particular example, I borrowed 100,000, but I'm paying the, the bank 91,000. So why wouldn't I use their money? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if those calculations are not in my favor, then I go back to mm -hmm. cash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. And um, you mentioned the GDP in terms of purchasing power. And uh, I remember, I may not have gotten the figures right, but there was a calculation that the value of a human being in Kenya now is one million. Like, uh, I don't know whether the mathematics was if we sold everything and then divided <laughs> the money amongst ourselves, everybody gets one million. Assuming economics works like that, this is a stupid question. Assuming economics like, works like that, like we want to balance the equation, kill them to a people, meter, 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 meter. What happens? Like you give everyone a meter? Yes. Um, we agree. I to sell everything, we start on a level playing field as Kenyans. We love each other that much. What a kilam to a dungwe million yake, to one pamoja. We'll end up exactly where we are. Um, because, and this is why communism didn't work. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the assumption there is that everybody is benevolent and everybody is working at the same rate and everybody has the same capacity, yes? Mm -hmm. If all those are true, yes. then if you give everyone a meter, 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 everyone's fine. Yes. But the reality yes. is that yes. that's not how it works. We can talk about drive, some people have more drive than others, okay? So that's one. Um, we can talk about preferences. People have different preferences than others. There are people who would comfortable with 500,000. They'll say even a meter is tacky, just give me 500K. I was you know, confident with, with, with my aspect. There are people who will want more. Uh, usually it's the losers who will definitely not want that, that aspect. Mm. But it does work as an equalization of, of, of opportunities. And the Scandinavians have done this very well in terms of like, okay, you don't give everyone a million in cash, but you give them the equivalent in purchasing power through other soft skills. So you pay for their education. You make sure that at least you can try to eliminate abject poverty. So at least in your own country, people are not going hungry. If we solve that particular one, which is on the equity side of things, then you give people an equal playing field, at least to start on. So leveling the playing field is not about giving everyone an equal amount of money in cash. It's about creating equal opportunities. It's about creating equal opportunities, yeah. Um, it's about creating equal opportunities. Because equal in cash, 
there are a lot of factors that we would have to be like, okay, someone in Yahururu or someone in Nairobi will say, hey, look, one million in Nairobi is very different from one million in Nanyuki yeah, or yeah. one million in Meru. Then you have to start having on those particular calculations. Huh? Mm. Um, it will be very difficult to make, it's very difficult. We call them single peak preferences. It's very difficult to make everyone happy with one outcome. Huh? Because people are different. Huh? Okay. Um, Bef before, before we close with the Kadogo economy, which you had very interesting math about how expensive it is. Um, right now, when you talk about life, comfort, and ease of resort, uh, by Kenyan standards, you probably, I'm just saying uh, in probably, that the wealth you've created, converted in Kenya, will probably put you in the billionaire's club. Chances are, maybe. Right? Converted. Everything yeah. converted. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you do such mathematics? Like, becoming, com coming back to Kenya to be a billionaire? To be a billionaire. <laughs> Or it's easier to be a millionaire in America than to be a billionaire in Kenya? Uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, I remember my first million. Um, the, it was the most difficult. Huh? You remember the example that I gave last time, you know, it's sweat of your brow. Discounting the abject poverty, everything else, getting to a million, whether it's Ugandan Kenya shillings or uh, dollars, it's, mm. there's a formula to it. And... Everyone can do it. God is no respecter of persons. It's a, I wouldn't say it's an easy thing to do, but if you are forthright and you follow it, it can be doable. Now, the six years compounding interest formula. Six years compounding interest formula, but then I also have shared to, in our yeah, last conversation. But you also have to realize that even though it's easy, you know, it's, sorry, sorry, let me check that back. Even though it's doable, it is not necessarily achievable for everyone because there are factors that may limit when they get there. I was able mm -hmm. to do that much earlier on in my life than most people, but I had a significant head start, okay? I was teaching college when I was 23. I had my PhD when I was 27. So I had a significant head start. And then by chance, I, or divine intervention, I ended up working for the World Bank. So people's starting salary and my starting salary, in terms of it were completely different, you know, for. For, for some, what I got on my first paycheck was their whole entire lifetime. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can't expect us to be in the same particular place. But to your question... Whether it's easy to be a, 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 a millionaire in America versus a billionaire in Kenya. I come to Kenya because one is home. That's the main driving factor. Mm -hmm. Two, the cost of living is a lot more affordable. So I'm able to stretch my dollar a lot more. So if you give me $30,000 and ask me where am I going to go, I'm on the next flight to Kenya because yes. that $30,000 in the U.S. will barely get me to half the year in Kenya, especially if I'm, Retirement. you know, you can retire on, on $30,000. Literally, you can, mm, no? yeah, because mm, mm. people put you a golden handshake. And on, you know, yeah. I remember when my mom got her golden handshake, it was 480,000 Kenya shillings. You know, it was a lot of money and still is a lot of money. Uh, but if you give me 480,000 Kenya shillings in Nairobi, I would, I, I, don't, I don't know what I would do with it. <laughs> because I would, uh, for others, it's everything they've ever seen. Okay? For other people, it may be like Wajekatea, you know, mm -hmm. uh, aspect of it, <laughs> you know, uh, to some of, our, uh, some of our rich friends. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you, answering your question a little bit more candidly, I like Kenya, it's home, with its wins and losses, problems and advantages, it's still home. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I come back collectively and the reason why I live here, you know, I have a home here, is because I believe in giving back and bringing those resources back home. Back home. Why just feed the IRS? when I can feed the KRA and hope that they will convert those to roads, you and know, have change. conversations like this. You know? okay. um, we, have to, we have to come back home, one, because it's home, two, mm. you know, it's home, we have to but come otherwise, back. otherwise, you would rather be in America as a millionaire than settle in Kenya as a billionaire? No, 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 I would rather, look, you give me, you don't even have to, you don't have to give me a million. Okay, forget the home part, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that it's home. Uh, 
if you give me my earning salary, forget the millions that I've invested, mm -hmm. and just give me that and put me in Kenya, I'm comfortable because life is much easier with that aspect. In, 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 in the US, you give me 100,000 US dollars, and I'm in Washington, DC, that's, uh, that's, yeah, that's, 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 that's expensive. That's six months. That's expensive, yeah. Ah, okay. Sawa, so, sawa. So, as we close, um, to complement the, the concept of how expensive it is to be poor, you say that the thing that we think at, is caring for the poor people, they are selling them things at uh, smaller quantities, is actually more expensive than buying the bigger things. And this also complements the idea of purchasing power and economies of scale. Yeah, so, yeah, the example that I gave yesterday when we were having lunch with you was, if you're poor, it is very difficult for you to reap the benefits of economies of scale. Because una nunua, pole pole. Yes, yes, yes. Okay? You like have to, to you, even at 3kg propane tank, LPGs, it's too much. Huh? Mm. If they could mm. give you like a 500 grams. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> you yes, know, yes. But there's no economy of the scale in that. You know, for me, it's like, I don't want to be going to total every day. You know, when I first was buying my tank, I asked the, the, the driver, uh, what's the biggest one I can get? He said, you know, 50 kg, it was like in Leteo. Then he goes, it wouldn't fit in my car. You know, I was thinking, it's really 50 kg, I was forgetting about the expansion. I was, but because I don't want to be doing that every day. But then I get an economy to scale for it. And that's just in one example. In other things, in, if I'm buying groceries, there's a value if I'm able to buy a lot of them at once, as opposed okay. to buying them slowly. So over time, it ends up being very, very costly. Then now when you put taxes, VAT, and everything else into that, mm. we end up crippling that person because even the little that they have, we take, you know, big chunks. And one of the unfortunate things that I have to say about this country when it comes to VAT is taxing basket goods. That does not make any sense why we should be taxing food and medicine. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the people who suffer the most from those decisions are the very same ones we're trying to get for during elections, but the very same ones that we're saying we're building up. Mm -hmm. But okay. typical taxation policy is there's just certain things you don't tax. Okay. Medicine being one of them. There should be no VAT on medicine. There should be no sales tax on medicine. It doesn't make any sense because it's, for a lot of these things, nobody's taking medicine from a choice, huh? yeah. <laughs> you know? So why am I penalizing them twice? There's, the, there's a lack of humanity into that. Food as well. Giving someone 16% VAT, prepared food is a separate question. If I'm going to Charlie's Bistro, yes, have VAT on there because I'm going to a restaurant. But in the United States and in multiple other countries, you don't tax food because it disproportionately affects the ones who have the most to lose. Ah, okay. So, so and um, before, uh, I, I don't want to lose this for whatever reason. In terms of budgeting, I will tie it to two points. Uh, if you, uh, one, to your, your tenant, if you, uh, to follow this, and uh, do your mathematics in terms of the Kadogo economy, like buying things in, in small quantities versus large sums. If you could do your mathematics of everything you need annually, like let's say, for example, you do your budget like the government. Uh, say, for example, uh, when the, at the beginning of, uh, now, uh, I just loaded why people call me, for example. Um, when you do uh, your rent at the beginning of the year, you pay your rent for the whole year. You pay your school fees uh, if you have children for the whole year at the beginning. Uh, you budget for your food and transportation at the, uh, at the beginning. You do everything such that for the rest of the year, uh, you just live life and possibly deal with uh, small, small issues. Is this a gateway to a comfortable life? I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't do that for a variety of things, a variety of reasons. The first one is, if you don't have the capacity whatsoever to budget, then it makes more sense to come on a jotenda kukunyo siku and you may drink your rent, mm. by all means, pay your rent yes. first. Yes. Okay? Uh, but the reason why you shouldn't or why I wouldn't do that, let me give an example with, with, with myself. 
So my tenants have given me $60,000 in cash, lump sum. But my bank wants me to pay that in, every month, okay? In, in monthly aspects. That if means $5,000 every month. Roughly, yeah. Yes. Um, it's less because there's a profit aspect there. Mm, but mm, mm. if I take that 60000 and I drop it into the bank and tell them I've paid my mortgage in full, mm -hmm. next month they'll come to me and I'll be in default because I'm supposed to pay my mortgage every single month. If I pay a big sum up front, it doesn't mean that it reduces what I have to pay the, the following month on a mortgage. Rent, it makes the same way. You can come to your rent and pay it all in full huh? because you tell your landlord, Nimeli Payote. But the mortgage doesn't work that way. But it reduces the principal. It reduces the principal, but you still have to pay next month. Okay, so you have reduced the principal, but you still have to pay next month. So in my particular case, if my mortgage is $1.3 million and I pay 60,000, 60, mm. yes, I've reduced the principal, but I still have to pay next month. And maybe I didn't need to pay 5,000, next month I'll pay 4,950, but I still have to pay. There's no way around it. But beyond that, there's another reason why you shouldn't do that, a more practical reason. It's because the amount that I'm paying for school fees, for rent, is usually locked. Huh? It's not changing every month. Okay, it's locked. Unlike food, which is changing every month based on how the market is going. Huh? Can you rent? We have signed a lease. I'm in mean, 135000 You pay 135000 every month. So if I know I have 135000 that I need to pay every month, why would I pay it all lump sum if I have the money up front? When I can take that money, put it in a CD or in another place, and earn interest on money that I would have had to pay anyways. So in that particular aspect, that 60,000, let's round it up to 100,000 for easy mathematics. I take it and I put it in a high yield savings account in the United States, earning 5%. It means at the end of the year, I will have $5,000, okay? If I had paid it all lump sum, I wouldn't have that $5,000 in interest. And this $5,000 is technically one month full payment. One month full payment. Now mortgage. I can go on vacation in that, I can do whatever I want with that, as opposed to paying a lump sum. So that's why I usually would not pay lump sum. There's some things that, yeah, you can pay lump sum, especially if there's an economies of scale tied to it, then yeah, pay them lump sum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, Manze, Asante Sana Doc. I believe we've covered this conversation comprehensively. Uh, we may never cover enough as far as money is concerned. And I believe now that you're going back to the US, uh, we can do research, we can get feedback from our audience in terms of the other conversation they would like uh, you to touch on. And then we can always plan another one. Good thing you are in financial freedom, so you can come to Kenya anytime <laughs> you want. Yeah, I'm going to the US on the 29th, and then I come back two and a half weeks later, so we can have this conversation again. Yeah. Good vibes. Yeah. Asante Sam. Yeah. So Kenya is a good place to be. Weather, we call you winter, so mm. yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> ah, sawa, sawa. <laughs> What's yeah. the good vibes they should expect? You know, it's funny because uh, people in diaspora are yearning to come back and people here are yearning to go there. <laughs> right, uh, Basically, everybody needs their own experience. Yeah, and the large part is the grass is, it feels as if the grass is always green on the other side, but uh, it's not. All else being equal, Yes, travel. Travel is good. You know, uh, Charles, uh, 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 Charles Dickens has mentioned that extensively on what travel uh, does for the mind and exposure and everything else. Because you find people are just, you know, uh, going around reciprocally in their own wave of thinking without outside interference and everything else. Travel opens the mind, which is good. Uh, but it doesn't mean necessarily you have to stay there. There are, there are reasons why people would migrate out of their own country. Uh, mm. if there's war and pestilence, okay? Um, but if there isn't, you know, no one is chasing me out. You know, the Ruto hasn't called and said, you know, like they did to the other Canadian, Kenyan where, talker, you know, for me, I'm, I'm still able to come. Yeah. Interesting you say that, because uh, my friend Jackson Mwangi, uh, who runs Cine Studio, um, who we are partner with, partnering with in production, told us that uh, when he made his first million, he went to ask his dad for advice on what he should do with the money. Yeah. And the father told him to go and travel. Yeah. Like, no, you go good. and yeah. travel with that yeah. money. Yeah. And no, no investing, no yeah. money, you go travel. And, and speaking of first million, um, it's the first million it was March 27th, 2017. That's when I made my. 2017? Yeah, 2017. That yeah. reason? Oh, yeah. dollars. Dollars, yeah? In dollars, huh? Yes. My, my first million in dollars, okay. Now, 
<laughs> yeah, the first billion in dollars. Okay. Now, in that particular aspect, uh, mm -hmm. it took me 2017, 33 years uh, to, make, to make that first million. Uh? You so know, you, you made... count the school and everything else. Yes. You know how long it took me to make my second million? Eight months. Uh, and the third million, even less than that. It's just the first one goes very hard to do with sweat of your brow. The next one kind of almost works for itself. Yeah. And it becomes yeah. much, much easier to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you said Haikwashangiati was when the bank was any pesayango. You go sit with it in the house, watch it and then bank it the next day. No, in fact you can come rob me at gunpoint. It's not in the bank. I can't liquefy it, you know, mm -hmm. like, you on know, like this is, is on short notice. Huh? I need mm -hmm. to, to plan. Huh? So it's all about capacity. It's all about capacity. If you were to do yeah. something yeah. for that would cost, uh, say, 150 million Kenya yeah. shillings, yeah. you, as in, you would sit in the house watching YouTube, uh, a review of a house costing 200 million, say, I can buy that. That's the feeling. That's the... You know, so the, 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 the second piece that I did uh, on that one was uh, my friend's joke, David doesn't spend money, he's very frugal. Mm -hmm. But when he makes a purchase, he makes up for, <laughs> for all the times he yeah, all yeah. the times he hasn't done it. Mm -hmm. But for me it's I I I really I don't buy a lot of things anymore. Um, but when I do, I do them because I've been planning them and some of them is a Kwango Kia. You know, you'd be like that's an amazing deal. Mm -hmm. Let's close it now. Yeah. Okay? And I move yeah. very quickly. The calculations yeah. are done in my head on the returns on investments. Um, and it becomes muscle memory. Uh, yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, I always should be an athlete. It's, it's much easier to figure out a good deal. It doesn't necessarily mean that you don't make bad decisions. The first investment I made in Kenya, I lost millions. What, but... what investment was that? <laughs> so uh, tell, tell me so that we don't make the same mistake. So... Uh, you know, uh, Theodore Roosevelt said, trust but verify. Yes. Uh, you know, I'm too quickly trusting. Huh? Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a lot of good ideas in Kenya, yeah. but uh, a lot of them are not well reasoned. And I don't think the person who lost us money did so with the plan of the intent to lose us money. Mm -hmm. I just thought they had not calculated what we call a stress test of what would happen in a liquidity crisis. Stress test. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. what happened to SVB. SVB yes. collapsed not because they didn't have the money, yes. but because they were not able to survive a stress test. Yes, yes, yes. The money yes. was locked away somewhere. And that's yes. the same thing. So for me, I, I, I invested in a SACO um, that was highly reputable, mm -hmm. uh, especially amongst our community. It was big on financial SACO that has a church name around it? Yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah, 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 yeah. But do you have hope of getting your money back now that well, the senior yes, nini was... That, that one, I've, you, you, if they do, yeah, but I've put it out of my mind. That one is gone. Just for the sake of reducing depression yeah. for the person who lost 300,000 shillings, how much did you uh, lose? You, as a family, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's a lot. It, it, it's a lot. Tell it's, us in dollars, and you to see uchungu na So... So let me put it this way. It took me about four years to recover my savings. Uh, uh, you recovered? Yeah, I, I did recover. I would have made that million much earlier than 2017 had I not lost that. that so that we are talking at least 200 million. Yeah. And actually, for me, that particular experience, I did not invest in Kenya until 2018. Like I said, Watch a guy. It's like this. There's no possible way I'm, yeah. I'm bringing my money back into the country yeah, yeah, yeah. because of uh, you have to be there. You physically you have to follow your money, make sure it's earning for you. Whereas mm. there, I'm like, I just lock it up, and I know it's. Mm. I just read statements. But now, as a good Christian, and now that the circle was tied to the church, you had to feel the pain. So it was, okay. So you know, I. I there's, for me, I get over things very quickly yes. because I don't, you know, keep revisiting the problem. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't cry over spilt milk. It has happened, it has happened. There's nothing I can do to get it back. Yeah. So now I just recognize that particular part, learn from that mistake, mm -hmm. and move on. Okay? In this particular one, then, you know, I visited the person in jail. Oh, you visited the person? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then, and, then, and then you move on. I mean, my whole entire family was tied in. First of all, there was a reputational risk. Yeah. Because I brought friends into it, you know, and, and everything else. Um, and it was like, hey, I think here we have a good thing. Huh? Mm. Uh, lo and behold, you know, stuff was happening yeah. you know, on the back end that, yeah. Was, yeah. that was outside. Now, the idea itself was good. And that's actually part of what we 
ended invested up in, in. Uh, doing in, and, and we, we brought that the ideas mm. uh, into part of WIRE, you know, in terms of the financial inclusion part, yes, you yes, know, yes. Comes, comes from that. Yeah. But, you know, it's painful. But what I'd say is like, look, in investments, you will have losses. It's guaranteed. There will not always be gains, okay? Mm -hmm. At the very least, let's try to reduce the losses from theft, manipulation, and those things, and keep the losses that are just macroeconomic or driven by forces. You, you can only reduce, you cannot eliminate. You losses can only reduce, yeah, because, uh, yeah, yeah, you can only reduce, huh? Because, okay, none of us, if you're a forex trader, yes. you had no control on the Kenya shilling rise or not. What happens if you like, you're like, oh, you know, mm. I, I need 100,000. US dollars, and you took all your Kenya shillings and converted them in 100,000 three weeks ago. Mm, uh, mm, because you mm. have taken a significant kick, yeah, 15% in three mm. weeks. Yes, <laughs> you know? yes, yes, yes. Now, worst part is you had borrowed that money uh, mm. because there are people who go to uh, borrow money. So, for me, at least on that particular one, there were others who cried more than I did. Because they were oh, left that was with, your consolation. They were left with, they were left with, with yeah. There's already. always one someone was off. You know, misery loves company. Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. At least mine wasn't alone. Mm, mm, mm. And, uh, up to this day, and I leap alone yeah. for an yeah. investment that they made that they will never get back. Asante Sanada. Karibu, it's a pleasure. Mazi, asante sana for sticking with us up to this point. I hope you enjoyed our content. I trust this was time well wasted. Please feel free to join our family by hitting subscribe and turning on the notifications bell. We have very good vibes uploaded on the channel. We have more good vibes coming through. I'm Dr. Kingori. See you on the next one.